there. Can we talk about Chainsaw Man? So if you've been watching my videos, you probably have noticed some themes I tend to bring up a lot that I really enjoy talking about. Distrust of institutions and authority, violent pornographic cartoons from Japan, and discussions of trauma in a way that isn't Steven Universe. So it should not be a surprise that I absolutely fell in love with Chainsaw Man, a 2018 shonen jet manga created by Tatsuki Fujimoto, a mangaka previously best known for his 2016 manga Fire Bo Wait. Wait, this is the same dude did Fire Punch? This explains a lot. Chainsaw Man's first arc ran until 2020 with a new arc launched in July of 2022 and its long-awaited anime adaptation expected to premiere this year as well. The manga having huge critical acclaim and being up there with Demon Slayer and Spy Family as must-read shonen manga of the past few years. The first volume of Chainsaw Man left me with the opinion that it was schlocky but amazingly illustrated juvenile antics with a horny protagonist, loads and loads of chainsaw-related violence, and gross-out humor. Fun with a unique premise, but not much more. But I continued to read it and was astonished to see the story slowly descend into concepts and themes so raw, so profound and gut-wrenching that by the final volume, this dumb manga about a dude who wants to touch the titty and can turn into a chainsaw had me crying like a weirdo. So today I want to talk about what makes Chainsaw Man so special and why all the hype around it and its upcoming anime is 100% founded. Yes, Chainsaw Man is like Dora Hidoro and Jujutsu Kaisen had a very violent baby, but it's all also about the price we pay to live comfortable lives. It's a story about how broken and damaged people find organic connection, but also about how easily for those who are vulnerable, connections can be manipulated and exploited. I'm recording this in the morning, so we're doing mimosas. Full warning, I am spoiling all the first arc of Chainsaw Man, and boy howdy does this manga have some huge ass twists and spoilers. Uh, I personally believe that a good story like Chainsaw Man can stand on its own even knowing these plot twists. I, I personally read Chainsaw Man knowing where it was going and still absolutely had a blast reading it. I'm making a video on it, obviously. But a lot of people are uh, hugely spoiler averse, so if that's you, go pause this video and check out Chainsaw Man. At the time of this recording, there's still an unofficial date for when the anime is coming out, but I really recommend this super easy to acquire manga. It's available on Shonen Jump, and its first arc, which stands alone, is only 11 volumes, so a very very, very easy to digest read compared to. <laughs> we go. Chainsaw Man is the story of Denji, an impoverished teenage boy who lives in extreme poverty and is in huge amounts of debt to the Yakuza thanks to the death of his abusive father. Denji attempts to pay off this debt by working as a devil hunter aided by the adorably cute and kind of an offbeat Yonin Vasquez design kind of way, Puchita, the chainsaw devil. After Denji is betrayed and killed by the Yakuza, Puchita revives and merges with him, allowing Denji to become an extremely powerful human devil hybrid, Chainsaw Man. He is recruited by the public safety division, a team of fellow devil hunters led by the cunning and manipulative Makima, who offers him a life of food, shelter, and possibly sex in exchange for his services. Out of context, Makima might appear as overly manipulative, but within Chainsaw Man, she is written and illustrated in such a girl boss, mommy dom kind of way that not only does she seduce Denji, but the reader as well. The setting itself of Chainsaw Man is rather interesting. Unlike most shonen anime that takes place in either past or present day with more fantastical elements, or in a clearly obvious fantasy setting, Chainsaw Man's setting is an alternative history of 1997 where the Soviet Union still exists. The devils themselves in this world get their powers based on how strong humans collect the fears of them are. Some fears are tangible, such as sharks, dolls, and snakes, while some fears are more intangible in nature, such as eternity, the future, and the cosmos. A side note, it's worth mentioning that the most powerful devil that Makima and the public safety division really want to kill is the gun devil, who is such an amazing allegory. There's a part where the president of the United States makes a contract with the gun devil in exchange for one year of every US citizen's life. It'd be a little too on the nose if it wasn't so fucking accurate. <laughs> this manga is so good, you guys, because it has little details like this that hurt. <laughs> Poor plucky child coming into powers and being recruited by an institution to do the murder is a pretty typical shonen trope, but unlike other protagonists who are endearing and you root for, well, 
Denji kind of sucks. Not in the, this character is too whiny, why didn't he get in the robot kind of way. He, he's written to suck in a way that's very deliberate and still very much in line with the people you meet in your day-to-day -day life suck. Hell, the entire cast just has major It's Always Sunny vibes going on. Makima is extremely manipulative and using her sexual wiles to exploit a poor, impoverished kid. Aki is the brooding Sasuke Torodoki Megumi one. Himeno is an alcoholic who uses her drinking as an excuse for not respecting boundaries or laws of consent sometimes. Kubini is a coward and willing to sell out Denji at the first sign of conflict. Power is the anime embodiment of the Gerbling King dude with a total disregard for basic hygiene. And Kishibe, no notes. He is perfect. I love him. It's not unheard of to make an anime cast of extremely unlikable people for comedy purposes, but with Chainsaw Man, something deeper is going on. Something I want to dive into using the handful of psychology classes I took in community college. So if you've ever had any interest in the social sciences, you might be familiar with the Marshmallow Test, aka the Stanford test that didn't conclude that people who go to Stanford are abusive and power-hungry assholes. In the study, a child was placed into a room and shown a marshmallow. They were told if they ate the marshmallow, there would be no negative consequences. However, if they waited for 15 minutes without touching the first marshmallow, they would receive a second marshmallow as well. This study in how well a child could exert self-control in order to achieve delayed gratification was also cited in how well they would do in the future. The idea that a child with that level of willpower was more likely to have success in their future schooling and eventual career. There's just one problem. It never happened. In 2018, a new study from NYU went back to the marshmallow test and realized something. In a recreation of the 1960 test with a larger number of children in the study, the biggest factor of if children passed the marshmallow test or not was not due to their willpower, but their socioeconomic backgrounds. Which makes perfect sense. A child with a food secure family who is having their needs met is more likely to believe they'll get a second marshmallow. But a child from an impoverished or food insecure family who might not know the next time they're able to eat or has a family who might have to break their promises to their child is going to act far more on impulse and those instincts that say, eat the marshmallow. And I bring this up because Denji would utterly fail the marshmallow test. He has grown up in a world where he is constantly abused and exploited, where his key desires are things like food and sex. This kid's so below Maslow's needs of hierarchy, his idea of luxury is bread with jam on it. He has no one who's ever shown him true love or friendship, so of course it, it makes perfect sense that he's going to be a crass and horny little shit. Which leads him right into the hands of Makima. So I'm going to say this one more time, we are jumping into the spoilers. I know a better YouTuber wouldn't drop a huge spoiler like this like a quarter halfway into the video, but I really need to spoil this in order to openly talk about the rest of my video, so you have been warned. So remember how I said some devils are tangible concepts and some devils are intangible concepts? So yeah, the most powerful devil in the world is not the tangible gun devil, it is the intangible control devil, who also happens to be Makima. And she has a major it was me Dio moment where she reveals her entire plan has been to manipulate and exploit Denji so she could get him under her control, which she has done, by the way, by murdering two of the other people closest to him. And holy shit. I can't put into words enough what a fantastic villain Makima is. In a world of, oh ho ho, I'm a smiley little evil boy, and oh ho ho, I'm the girl who was mean to you in high school, Makima is brilliant. This bitch is up here with Johan from Monster and what a fantastically written and terrifying character she is. Someone who is clearly manipulative and seductive, but also extremely good at showing just a few hints of vulnerability to make the reader give her the benefit of the doubt. Your mileage may vary for your favorite villains, but my favorite villains will always be not the ones who have an insane amount of superpowers and going up against them is on par with trying to fight a god, but the ones whose actions reflect a little too closely on what terrible people in our own world do. You might have guessed it because I use it for my b-roll a lot, but one of my favorite shows to watch is The Boys. The main antagonist of the show is Homelander, an all-powerful megalomaniac who might be unstoppable. This man has terrorized countless people and done unspeakable things. And for me, one of the creepiest scenes is when he forcibly outs his bisexual teammate. That's it. It's an incredibly cruel and invasive thing to do, and he didn't need laser eyes or the power of flight to do it. He just needed to be cruel, manipulative, and controlling. Anyone with no fucking conscience could have done what Homelander did. And that's the part of it that's so terrifying. And that's why Makima is so terrifying. Yes, her absolute control over extremely powerful devils is scary. 
The fact that she appears to be immune to damage and can obliterate anyone in her way is scary, but you're never going to meet anyone like this. What you will meet in your day-to-day -day life is people who find poor, vulnerable, marshmallow test feeling people like Denji and manipulate and exploit them for all that they're worth, to the point where she obtains complete control over Denji by simply offering him what he needs and cutting away, sometimes literally, anyone else he has connection to, a very common tactic amongst abusers. One of her most terrifying moments is when she invites a completely broken Denji into her apartment full of dogs, and what should in theory be shorthand for a cozy and loving home becomes terrifying, because we realize these dogs are how Makima views everyone else in her life, loyal creatures to be coddled who don't ever question the control she has on them. And there is a slow and dreadful buildup as she takes a human being, now completely under her control, and murders one of his closest friends right in front of him. It'd be easy enough to go, Makima's a great villain because she's a manipulative bitch, but as I keep saying, there is depth in this hehe <laughs> chainsaw go rur story. It is later revealed that Makima deeply wanted equal and healthy relationships, to have that kind of love and connection, but was unable to form them through anything else but power or fear and her manipulation of Denji is a prime example of this. Makima has become someone who, even if this is what she wanted when she was younger, is someone who no longer has the capacity for such connections. Now, I wouldn't have dived so much into this topic because as I've said in other videos, I'm not super interested in trying to give a fictional character assignments in the DSM-5, but one, this is a very fantastic yet sympathetic way to write a villain. And also, Chainsaw Man offers an amazing antithesis to the harm that manipulation and control can do. It's, wait for it, healthy connections. So for a lot of people who want to heal from an upbringing where they developed unhealthy coping mechanisms and wish to heal, a lot of therapy is going to be about interpersonal effectiveness, aka how to build healthy relationships. And early on in Chainsaw Man, Denji becomes roommates with courtesy flesh-impaired blood fiend Power. Power starts off as being a grimy little freak who, similar to Denji, is selfish and impulsive. Eventually their relationship grows into an amicable one, and they come to respect each other and work as a team, with Denji even being there for Power after she's traumatized by the Darkness Devil. While Makima has been working at manipulating Denji in order to connect with him, both Denji and Power have connected organically. And this all comes into full play where the now fully devil power defies Makima's wishes and saves the first friend she's ever made, forming a contract with Denji and sacrificing herself in order so that Denji can live, with the only request of the contract being that Denji come and find her. Just like how power's friendship and love of Denji saves him, Makima's lack of connection is her undoing. In the final showdown with Chainsaw Man, Denji is able to get the drop on her. And he tells my beautiful and perfect Kishibe that he has a hunch that Makima actually never saw faces, only going by the scent of devils to gauge who a person was. That Makima never saw Denji as who he was, a sad boy full of hurt and trauma, but also someone driven and scrappy with the capacity to grow in love. Like any true abuser, she only ever saw Denji for what he could give her, and what she could take from him. A fact that Denji struggles to accept, which is heartbreaking as it's so common for someone to have difficulty in realizing that a relationship might be unbalanced, and even more difficulty in the struggle to confront the harmful person in their life. There's a sad moment where Denji, despite all of this, says he still loves Makima, an aspect that's talked about a lot with people who hurt others, because behind their hurtful and self-destructive behavior and their off-putting and manipulative and demanding nature, there are traits many people love about them. I appreciate the scene because despite these feelings, Denji still understood the importance of stopping Makima and then eating her. Look, it's a thoughtful manga, but it's, it's still an edgy manga about a dude who's a chainsaw. The arc of this manga ends on a very loving and profound little thought I wanted to touch on. So we're going back to psychology here with another study, the Harlow Monkey Experiment. Psychologist Harry Harlow would take infant monkeys away from their mothers and offer them two options for a surrogate mother. One was made from wire that provided milk, and the other, despite offering no food, was made from terry cloth. Harlow learned that these baby monkeys would always choose physical comfort from the terry cloth mama over the food providing wire mesh mama to the point where they would cling to the terry cloth mama until they were famished and only briefly went over to the wire mama for food before returning to the terry cloth one. While these studies were deemed unethical and cruel, it did show something that, believe it or not, mid-century America did not realize. That physical touch, comfort, and affection is an inherent desire in many sociable animals. 
Pochita says at the beginning of the manga, he will form a contract with Denji in exchange for seeing all of Denji's dreams. And in the final chapter, he tells Denji his own dream was to have someone hug him. The final chapter ends as Denji is tasked of taking care of a now reincarnated Makima, Kishibe believing that if she can be raised of love, the cycle of her becoming the control devil will be put to a stop. There's a beautiful lack of nihilism in Chainsaw Man, the idea that even the worst person like Makima can gain healthy bonds the same way that Denji and Power are able to. Puchita's suggestion that Denji can do this by giving her lots of hugs. Given how cruel Makima was to Denji and Denji's own abusive upbringing, it's a powerful statement that he's determined to break the abusive cycle by putting himself in the role as Makima's loving caretaker and, well, giving her lots of hugs. It's a hopeful suggestion that maybe love and affection can prevent us from becoming the cruelest of monsters. I'm very fond of media that is a commentary on current society, on capitalism, global warming, the war machine, control of women's bodies. But at its core, Chainsaw Man is a story of the abuse of power, not just on a broad scale, but on a deeply personal one. Something that I think is sadly an aspect of human nature that won't go away, even if the rest of the world's problems do. Chainsaw Man is a silly manga about blood and guts and violence, and yet it has such a thoughtful take on the evils of control and how important it is to find healthy connection in a terrible and messed up world. Because connection through friends, through community, will be what gives us strength, what gives us courage to do what's right or simply get through the day and will prevent us from just lying down and rotting. When stuff is shit, it's easy to fall back into the comforts of media, of plucky people having the courage to do what's right. And I'm just happy to find such a hopeful story hidden between the snoo and entrails of this terrible world. That's all for today. Thanks for letting me talk about Chainsaw Man. Hi my dudes, hope you're all well. I wanted to give a huge thanks to my script consultant Saji who really helped me work through a few bits I was struggling with while writing this, and also a huge shout out to Irving for being so nice and offering to make the score for me. He does amazing work, so I'll be linking to where you can find him if you'd like some stuff composed for your own videos as well. As always, special thanks to my big spender patron Kurt Schiller who requested I say, mm -mm -mm. My friend Sam told me to read this, I didn't but I should, sorry Sam but not that sorry. Shout out to my patrons for being patient with me while I made this. I was originally expecting to get this out in July, but my part-time job turned into a full-time job and I got COVID. Uh, this both happened in the same week, by the way. If you want to become a patron and get early access to my videos and special behind the scenes peeks, head on over to Patreon where as little as $2 a month can make all your hopes and dreams come true. You can also make a one-time donation by buying me a coffee as well. Subscribe and share my videos around too. It helps a lot. I'll be back soon. Once again, thanks for all your support. Take care, my dudes.